Welcome to Journey into the Mystic, a podcast where we uncover the powerful intersections between the mystical and Eros. Eros is an essential energy force emerging from our desire for connection with ourselves, others, and the world. It evokes beauty and leads us to understand essential truths unifying masculine and feminine energies into creativity and genius. Each episode of the podcast delves into themes of liberation, healing, and connection, guiding those seeking deeper self-understanding and richer relationships. We explore practices and philosophies that unlock new dimensions of being, diving deep into mystical states and their significance for personal growth and well-being. Mystical states marked by profound changes in perception, thought, and emotion. They offer experiences of unity, timelessness, and deep insight, whether induced by meditation, prayer, psychedelics, orgasmic meditation, or spontaneous occurrences. These states evoke feelings of transcendence and profound connection. Join us as we explore the path to the mystical state through in-depth discussion, expert witnesses, and personal stories, offering insight, inspiration, and challenges at every turn. Today, I am joined by a new and very dear friend, Dimitri Mugianis, a harm reduction advocate and psychedelic practitioner, musician, writer, and community organizer, He became the face of using underground ibogaine to kick heroin addiction in the United States. He developed a hybrid modality of administration that integrates the ceremonial and musical elements of traditional ibogaine ceremonies with the best safety protocols of Western medicine. His story is the focus of the documentary, I'm Dangerous with Love, even though, even though ibogaine is still prohibited in the United States, it is attracting avid interest from researchers all over the world and becoming accepted among care providers and clinics. Dimitri has led over 500 ibogaine ceremonies and supported numerous individuals with their problematic habits. He's also performed thousands of ceremonies using sound, art, and psychedelics especially psilocybin and MDMA, to help individuals break with their psychological suffering and to spark spiritual awakenings. He has been immersed in the psychedelic space for the last 20 years. Dimitri is an expert in both the potential and limitations of psychedelic medicine, a respected icon in the field of harm reduction. He co-created a holistic program at New York Harm Reduction Educators, a groundbreaking Harlem-based community organization bringing together acupuncture, ritual, sound meditation, Reiki, body work, and other treatment modalities for people experiencing homelessness, active drug users, sex workers, and formerly incarcerated. He also owns and runs a ketamine clinic in New York called Cardera. Welcome, Dimitri. All right, well, we ready to get started. Ready to get started. Okay, great. Well, I'm very excited to have you. So let's see. I've I have so much to ask you, but one thing that I love about you and the work that you did that is also highlighted in your bio, which is you I believe you were one of the first people to use ibogaine to help people kick heroin. And I know that you've led over 500 ibogaine ceremonies. So I thought we could just start there with how you got started with ibogaine. Yeah, I, I wasn't the, amongst the first. I would I would say that I was in the second generation. But my okay, the, I think the two individuals or the three individuals most responsible for the the first cluster of folks. Um, being treated with Ibogaine would be Howard Lutzoff, Norma Lutzoff, and um, uh, Richard Oglobnik, uh, Richie Oglobnik. Um, and all three of them were friends, mentors, and teachers to me. So 
I should just to correct that and give. A, I agree. I love that. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's a whole beautiful story that we can digress. But Which I would, I hour. would love to hear. Yeah, I'd love to hear how you met them and trained with them, and I want to know all of it. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I can talk about how I got into it. I, I agree. Um, I, I had a twenty plus or twenty year heroin and cocaine habit, and then was using drugs. Um, before that, um, uh, often chaotically. So um, I would say maybe 35 years or something. Is that right? No, no, no. Yeah, I'd say um, 25 years of, of chaotic drug use because I was 40 when or 39 when I stopped that phase of my life. But, um, you know, I had uh, I was an IV drug user, uh, cocaine and heroin, for um, 20 years, um, uh, you know, originally began my use. Uh, people, I always tell people my first plant teachers were coca and poppy. Right. Uh, um, and um, no, so I had, you know, I was, I was injecting cocaine and heroin for many years. Uh, cocaine induced psychosis uh, from the injection was a good part of my life. Um, and, um, you know, I, I started as a, a way maybe of exploring uh, and sort of opening up um, my world and also as a means of, um, of treating pain that I didn't mm -hmm. know what to do with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that exploration part, the part that opened up my world, meaning that I could you know, write or make music or fuck or do all kinds of things on it with, for like a long time and not have to, and, and just be sort of in the work, sort of really present to it and pleasant mm -hmm. in the play. And then also opening up in terms of like sort of culturally, you know, where, where one could go with drugs, especially in those days, I think it's much different. It used to be like, erudite junkies were a thing you know um yeah but um but i don't Which i, I want to i want to bookmark this so we can come back to it because okay i call you know i called the podcast journey into the mystic because I, i'm fascinated with mystical states and myself and am a practitioner and explorer of mystical states and and what you're speaking to in the way that you talk about drug use is accessing the mystical state so at some point i want to come back to it but keep going yeah yeah cool yeah uh so i mean it opened up all of that and then it did numb the pain the, the, and or or address the pain or address anxiety or uh, but what ended up happening is that this opening you know it's a faustian deal right it started to get smaller mm -hmm. and smaller and so the things that I could do, you know, write and be involved in politics, all that stuff would get smaller and smaller and more constricted. And then the part about healing, healing pain, um, w the thing became painful in itself um, and the chasing of that. Um, and so my life got very small. Mm. I also... Well, I'm 62 years old, so I was I lived through um, the HIV/AIDS epidemic, mm -hmm. um, particularly in Lower Manhattan. If you look at um, like so, if, if there was a map of the world where the red blots would show, you know, the areas most affected, the neighborhoods I lived in would be similar than you know some parts of. Uh, I hope I don't get this wrong. I think Sub-Saharan Africa was one of them, maybe. But I, but it would um, be one of the hot, it'd be one of the hot spots in the world. Equal. Right. Um, and so, so I, I witnessed a lot of death. You know, people used to. Someone once said actually that, that AIDS was a disease of the hip. So like, there's mm -hmm. all these, mm -hmm. you know, gay people and um, and junkies and black women that were most mm -hmm. affected. So, um, uh, so you know, uh, people were also ODing and going to prison, and my life got very small. And I, you know, he was hanging out with 
with my heroes and doing art. And then when I found myself back in Detroit, you know, uh, in the basement of my parents' home. Mm. And um, I just wanted to, my first thought was suicide in the morning. My last thought was suicide. Um, I had a 200 plus day habit back then, 22 years ago. And um, I wasn't an artist. Um, I wasn't an activist. Um, my life had become small. Um, mm. And uh, my common law wife died from endocarditis um, due to injection and not being able to get clean uh, injection equipment. Um, mm. You know, um, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, um, Bill Clinton. Um, anyway, um, I was at, I was at the end, and I had a desire. I'm um, Greek American. I had a desire to go back to Greece, mm. um, and I couldn't because I was I had a habit. And I thought, you know, maybe if I could just go, then I could come back and just die because I just wanted to die. But I wanted to go for that. Um, and I had known about Iboga from um, my um, from hearing about it in New York in the '90s. Um, and it became this sort of sort of legend in um, the Lower East Side, and you know I was living at the Chelsea Hotel between Chelsea Hotel and Lower East Side, back and forth, and you know within artist circles and activist circles, and Dana Beal, the the yippie uh, who had a place on Nine Bleecker Street, was you know like prophetizing that, and I and I had met people who had done it, so I've known about it, and the, you know first time I heard about it, I was actually getting high with somebody. By name. I don't know. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. He was telling me how great it was and how it worked. That's a whole story there. Um, and, but he was injecting, which was clear, which was also something that, that would come back because people more than likely relapsed. So, oh, wow. um, so I, I, I remember that and I had contacted my friend uh, uh, Jerry Poynton, filmmaker and artist, and Jerry contacted Dana Beale. <clears throat> who put me in touch into the I Began Underground, <clears throat> which was <clears throat> just a few people. And I talked to Richie Oglovnik, who was going by Eric Taub back then. This is, I used to call him, frankly, three names, because he had another name, and it was all illegal and with burner phones and all that kind of shit. Yeah. So, because it's, a, it's, a, it's illegal in the States. It's a, it's right. a felony. Right. Um, so anyways, he, they got me in touch and, uh, with him, and I, and I told Richie, who was doing it out of Florida, and he said, well, if you're going to Greece, you should go to Sarah Glatt in outside of, um, outside of Amsterdam in Holland. And that's where I went. I went, um, I, I mustered the money together, which was really difficult because my family was not in a great financial state. And I went to the suburbs, um, the farming town called Brooklyn, which is Brooklyn, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Holland. And onto this farmhouse, so there was Sarah, who I thought Sarah would be this tall, blonde Dutch woman, this little, short, uh, Sephardic lady, dark Sephardic <laughs> lady greeted me, and she had six kids. And her, in running around this farmhouse, I mean, they didn't have a farm, but she was kind of a hippie, and her, her, her mother was there. Her mother looked kind of like my grandmother's. She was there from... Iraq, like, you know, that region, um, you know, swarthy, older lady like my grandmother. Anyways, and so I, I, I did the session there. My brother came with me uh, because uh, he was like, I'm giving you, you're getting, taking $2,000 and, and, and going to Amsterdam. Like, you know, back then, Amsterdam right. was like, right. for her. <laughs> so he's like, hell no. Anyways, I did it. I did a boga. I was actually drunk when I did it because I got drunk on the plane. All this kind of shit that these days would be crazy. And I did it immediately. I did did it basically just coming off of methadone, heroin, and cocaine. Wow. And uh, they wouldn't give it. We wouldn't do a detox like that now. There'd be right. all kinds of detox. Definitely not. Methadone. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and she gave it to me by doing kinesiology. That's how she decided how much I should take. But it was three days of 
very intense days of iboga. And iboga, for those who don't know, maybe I should just tell people what iboga yes, is. Iboga. I, yes, I was going to say, for, for those people that are watching or listening, if they don't know what it is, it would be great if you could explain mm -hmm. it. Sure. Iboga is, um, is a plant that is grown in Central West Africa, mostly in Gabon, but also in parts of Northern Cameroon. Um, there is a, it's the second layer of the root bark. That second layer is a powerful drug. You can say medicine. I like drug. Um, medicine sort of says that it's going to do something in particular and there'll be a particular outcome too. And I think that's erroneous when we're talking about psychedelics. These are drugs. Um, that could be medicine and I think people can decide whether it's a medicine after they've done it. For me, it was a medicine. Um, and it's also known as a sacrament, I should say that. It has been used for thousands of years in Gabon, mainly, uh, in Cameroon. Um, and a, um, it is the central sacrament to a spirituality called Bwiti, mm -hmm. um, very much like peyote or ayahuasca is a central sacrament in in you know um, it's, it's southern North America and South and Central America for ayahuasca and other other drugs San Pedro and those things so there's the Central Sacrament and then there is the culture and spirituality and spiritual technology that grows up around the ingestion of iboga right one of, and it's used a lot for initiation and also for um, healing of many many ways but one of the Interesting things. Oh, I should also say it's the highest threshold, uh, uh, um, that threshold, highest, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, gosh, not threshold. It's the most complicated psychedelic. Uh, I'm blanking on the word, but um, the most I, I complicated mean, I think, psychedelic. Yeah, I think threshold, I mean, I think threshold works. <laughs> Okay, uh, there's another word, but okay, well, it's the highest because um, it lasts a long time. It okay. can go on for a day and a half or more, and the recovery takes oh, a long really? time. Oh, yeah, and it's cardiotoxic. Right. Um, so people, some people die from a heart attack from it. Um, uh, it's a very long press process and the tripping is very long. And, and for some people, it can last even longer. And mm -hmm. then the come down can be very long. And um, one of the things, the way I believe that it's announced itself, if we want to apply those types of words to it, but I'm going to, um, it announced itself to the West um, in that it, interrupts physical dependence on opioids and opiates um, with mitigated or no withdrawal. And in some of the population, there is a decreased or alleviated um, craving for mm -hmm. opiates after. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not used that way in Gabon, at least not traditionally. Um, and then, you know, Howard Lutzoff, who I mentioned, had stumbled upon it. Uh, in the early 60s, and he happened to be, it's a whole story there, he happened to be a 19-year-old film student, 1962, this nerdy um, kid from the Bronx. Um, and he did it, and then that's a whole story, and then realized he didn't have a habit, and then he's the one that sort of, but that's a long story. So that's what, because that's a whole story. But IBA yeah. is a hydrochloride of a boga. Okay. And a hydrochloride of iboga. So very crudely, we can say to what coca is to cocaine, ibogaine is to iboga. Yeah, okay, it's so like one, it's one alkaloid. Okay, so what coca is to cocaine, ibogaine is to iboga. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and it's then, one alkaloid. One alkaloid, okay. I did the full plant, a full plant extract, but I'm, we're getting complicated here. Okay. So, so. So I'll just say Abigail Oboga, and we can sort of interchange them. There is a difference, but we can get, get into that uh, at some other time. We have That's for part two. So. We can get it, we can right get on. into the nitty gritty in part two. Okay. Right on. 
So, you know, I went through the process and it kicked my ass. The thing about when you're right. going through detox, at least in those days, and um, you go through these detoxes, you have to continue to give people more. So if you right. do it for like spiritual exploration or initiation, you just, you do, you, you do your doses over like, let's say three or four hours that it's done with a detox, at least back then you'd come down and they would give you more. So I was in that room. It turned out to be a, a little, one of the kids there, the oldest daughter who, no, the second daughter who was maybe a preteen. It was her bedroom. There's a windmill in the background. There's this ramshackle with six kids. And I was in this little girl's room. So there were so cute soccer players and pop stars on the wall. You know, and I was in this little bed. And I vomited and wept and cried mm -hmm. and saw these visions that were of my past, uh, of my ancestors, mm -hmm. of the future. The future wow. was revealed to me. Uh, and pretty pretty minute details in some cases, improvable and, and um, uh, well, at least to me, provable. And um, but you know, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. But I never felt a desire to use the entire time. And I remember staggering out, stumbling out, literally every excretion that could be excreted from a person, except for blood, was excreted. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, you know puke and cum and piss and shit and sweat and bile everything was coming out of me and you know day three i stumbled out early in the morning and I, you know i had these incredible visions that i could talk about but sometimes people's visions are like listening to someone's dreams <laughs> i don't know how many people are actually interested <laughs> you know but um but um i came out and um showered and sort of dragged myself to the living room and sat there on this big white couch the sunlight coming in and maybe it was six and this house was beginning to stir and the kids were getting ready for school and I just sat there mm -hmm. weeping and just repeating praise God and the wow. little girl who's a little sassy girl whose room I was in who, who she was giving me her room came in and said you know there was a black man from a place called the Bronx that was saying the same thing a few days ago now, praise God. He must have another jump in the can to detox there. So after that, I went to Greece and I spent three months and that was a whole journey of discovery. I didn't even know that there was this whole ancestral component that, that is part of the Bwiti and Gabon and the adjustment of Aboga. Mm -hmm. in, in the trip even, there was a you know, referral to Greece. So there was a a matriarch. I think one of the most significant things uh, is a, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. It, 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 reliving scenes of childhood trauma, some of them sexual, some of them emotional, some of them physical. You know, growing up in Detroit in the 60s and 70s, the loss of my wife, being relieved of that guilt. That was the one thing that I, I didn't really care if I used again. I, was, I knew I didn't kill my wife, uh, which you couldn't have convinced me of. Um, right. And then and then uh, visions of a teacher that would come to me, mm -hmm. and visions of um, of a, a woman, a matriarch in in, in the soil of Greece, uh, in the Peloponnese, just on my mom's side, just repeating, "Dead, dead so long, the dirt's gone through you," mm -hmm. and it was a very com comforting th thought. So, you know, um, I woke up sat there and um, I didn't need to use again. And then I was also just really moved. I had this vision that like I needed to go and do this, which it turns out like 80% of the people who do, I <laughs> decide to do that or, or try to. I mean, the thing I had going for me was that I didn't have a job. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have student debt. I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have anything. You know, I had no children. I didn't have any of those things. And and so in a way that I was sort of free to do this, this type of work. Right. I went to Greece, which was key because I spent three and a half months there. I spent three and a half months in, in the... Um, in, in the village of my grandmother, 
And um, she was long dead, but like sort of seeing who I was, where I came from. I hadn't been there in 30 something years. Wow. And um, and there was at one point that was really significant where I was in the village and um, the young people were all either in Athens working or in the States or Germany or Canada or someplace. I and mean, you know, there's, mm -hmm. they go away to work. It was before the summertime when people come back. It was late, late uh, spring. Um, and this old woman that was walking towards me that had a walk, a gait like my, my grandfather. By the way, the island is called Ikaria, which is Ikaros, and it's where uh, the blue zone is, where people live to be 100. Uh, one of the five blue zones. Wow. In the world. Yeah, yeah. And this woman, old woman, was coming towards me, and she had this gait. I used to call my grandmother John Wayne because she would walk like John Wayne on, like side to side, you know? And she looked at me and she said to me, I thought she said, who am I? But she said, who's are you? And my Greek's not very good. And uh, that really triggered something for me. Who, who's, who's was I? And I am mm -hmm. lucky that I could tell you where I come from and who I belong to. And once I told her who my grandmother was and who my grandfather was, turns out my grandmother baptized her. She didn't want to know anything oh my else. She sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. She sort of fixed me in her head. And that's who I belong to. And then she went on. Wow. Um, but it, but that moment has stuck with me. Who's am I? Who did I come from? But so, you know, so I was, I stayed there for three and a half months, you know, wanted to come back in a month. I had this, but I was burning with this desire to do, to start to do the work. So I came back and uh, uh, Richie, I called Richie and said, just chill out, like take a year, get in therapy. Um, get a job, get a place, just be on your own. So turning 40 and I, I did that. And within a year and a few months, we were in New York doing this insane project where we were just passing out flyers. We had a website, you know, an 800 number to commit a felony. And we were just, we were standing in front of methadone clinics and harm reduction spaces. Oh. We we're just, we're, we're passing out flyers saying we're doing this and we're doing it for very little or no money. And I was going to train that way and it was totally insane summer because it's yeah. it was you know one of the things about richie is he's he's brilliant and he but he, his non-attachment also can become on the material plane reckless and also incredible so there right. were some really scary moments people almost died uh but like at least the idea was that he was going to train all these people i got trained such as it was sort of on the ground and then i started to 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 provide this underground for many years. Um, that process lasted many years, uh, over a decade uh, doing that work. And um, I eventually found myself in Gabon, mm. um, uh, where I was initiated and I went back. I was the first uh, being provider to be initiated. I, uh, I went back about six times, I believe. Um, one, you know, one of the things um, um, that I first thing I got to Gabon, I, you know, I was for a couple of years, I was just giving people, I became in sort of a dark room, right? And just like the way I did it, like a, a, a room and there was no ritual, there's no container other than like right. a container of sort of radical hospitality and love, right? Just taking care of people, which is great. And I went to Gabon and they had ceremony they had they had a, a village that would take one person and the whole village would work towards this person getting over they were right. detoxing but they were coming either for initiation or working on what we would call like some sort of emotional issue what they would call uh, spells or um, mm -hmm. uh, problems of possession or, or and um, we could talk about the similarities and differences but what I saw was what I had experienced as a musician, as an artist, as uh, as an after hours club owner. I saw um, I saw them creating space in which people could process. Right, there was this beginning, middles, and ends. Um, there was the container of sound, incredible music that was repetitive and and played for someone. There was the performing arts as healing arts, basically, like sound, music, dance, singing. Um, and um, 
there's this container um, that was Bwiti, that was um, beautiful and strange. And um, so I got really fascinated with that and began to adopt elements of that into my practice back in New York. Um, and that took over my life where I was trying to see if there's an incorporation. Um, at the same time, there's a couple of things getting in the way of that. One, I'm a terrible student. I'm really bad, right? Um, two, part of being a bad student, but also a thinker, is that I don't like to submit uh, to hierarchy. And three, I'm a Greek boy from Detroit. And I'm not from Gabon. Okay. Um, and I went through three levels of initiation and it was beautiful and really important to my life and continues to be important to my spiritual career, to my spirituality and to the way I do work. And I'm always in gratitude, but like, I'm not that. Hmm. I am from here. Hmm. Um, the other thing that was happening in my work with detox is I was also working and harm reduction drop-in spaces for homeless people at the same time. I started to see this conflict between this idea of harm reduction, like meeting everyone where they're at and sort of reducing the harm, and this idea of detox. We're trying to find this cure for drugs. What I was doing, which was damaging, which I think psychedelics and broadly are doing, I think often people on a spiritual path in a spiritual tradition do this. They're prophetizing, uh, mostly for out of really good places, um, and working towards a result that was their personal result or a result they've seen in other people. But it's, in case of Iboga, in the case of most psychedelics, not the result that would be most likely. So... I became, in a way, a poster boy for Iboga for maybe 10 years. Mm. Um, this is before YouTube and before social media really taking off. There was Facebook and stuff, but there was documentaries made about it. One of the visions I had, I was going to do all this media stuff. I knew that I was going to be on This American Life. It told me that. And then I was. I mean, it's kind of crazy. You were? So the idea that, you have to send me yeah, the episode. Yeah. I want to listen to it. It's really, it's probably 18 years old. But yeah, sure. Um, but um, as I'm digressing. The idea was that like, I became the spokesman for it and then people would come to me and I was trying to deliver what happened for me. Mm. And by doing that, I was turning people into, I was turning the, the ceremony, the time we spent together into a process mm. that was expected result. And so what was, that was doing was people were coming and the other results were happening but most likely they would return to the chaotic use of, uh, of drugs, mm -hmm. uh, dangerous or chaotic use of drugs. Um, and then we would simply ignore what happened. We would ignore what, what else could have happened. Okay, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. When you say you ignored what happened or what else could have happened, what do you mean? Happened... Well, in, 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 in the experience, theory. maybe, yeah. It, we, that, well, first of all, that they came, that's a big deal. Right. They came to do this thing. That they were held and honored, that's a huge deal. Right. That they may have had an experience within the, the experience with the drug and themselves and whatever spirit you might think is moving about, I think is moving about in which they could see a relationship, forgive something, move, move somewhere, do something, pick up the phone when they're done, call their mom, whatever it was. All that's out the window. And ultimately, you've came for the miracle drug of psychedelics and you did, you were using again, or your so-called PTSD or your so-called bullshit DSM diagnosis is still acting out. So therefore, not only 
did is it a failure but it's a it's a failure on acid right it's like the it's a higher failure because this stuff does this thing that happened with dimitri this stuff cures veterans from killing people right they just heal from the fact that they've just killed a bunch of people and if they have any sort of symptoms then then you know then they're part of that part that you know are maybe quote treatment resistant right right so the idea is that we're we're perpetuating a lie a medicalized lie that says that point a does point point a to point b right Mm -hmm. Like, like you take this this happens and then you need to do the work. Integration is important and that, I don't know. I mean, what is integration? What, how, why is it important? Why is it not important? I understand that people need to process with each other, but if you're going to do it to get some sort of result like that at the end, this is not antibiotics. This is something right. different. This is not like, like putting, putting your leg in a cast. This is something different. And, to, and so I got people who are, it damaged them. I damaged them. The psychedelic movement damages people because it reinfer it, it re it reinforces this idea of brokenness, and then it also also like the, what healing is, what experience is. Maybe they have a different relationship with shooting ten bags a day. All right, maybe there's a, a different relationship. Maybe and, and so what I was seeing. You know the Foucaultian idea of the medical gaze. Tell me. Uh, well, basically, that the medical it looks at somebody, a doctor, the the, the gaze. The, 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 yes. Sometimes it sounds like gaze. Yeah. Yes. Right. So you're looking at someone as this disease. You're looking at something as right. a thing. There's yeah. a medical gaze and there's a shaman's gaze, and there varies. And it could also be, yes. there's also totally a guru agree. gaze, yeah. a meditation teacher's gaze, a yogic gaze. All of that is looking at somebody as a thing, and there's a system that can, that can fit, a thing that is not only a thing, a thing that is broken, and you can, there's a formulaic system in which you can be fixed, and that just happens to be going through the shaman, the guru, the doctors, their protocol. And so right. they decide fix, not fix. They decide how that fix happens. And it's simply, first of all, it's not the way it works, but it's corrosive and damaging. Um, and so I started to really start to look at this and then realizing that I'm not from Mabriti, I honor it. I, I, I still practice aspects of it. Right. My, my, Process, my, I started to really think about like the ceremony, what, what I'm doing. I, would, I was constantly trying to contextualize aspects that, uh, of the beauty, like maybe going, why are we going to talk to the ancestors of the forest? And I would, ha- I would try to bring it into a Western mind, but I began to feel like the, 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 the teacher, Maladona Somme from Burkina Faso, told me that what I was doing. I was, was literally off- just going to ask you about him. Keep going. This is great. Yes, keep really? going. I, 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 yeah, I was, liter- I was literally going to ask you. I was going to. So he wrote this article called What mm-hmm. a Shop Sees in a Mental Institution, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is one of the most brilliant articles I, I think I've come across in terms of what you're talking about. And because what he was saying is what we view as sickness is an initiation. And actually, Joan Halifax has this quote that basically says, um, you know, you you fall into these things that are you that look like sickness, right? You fall into poison, but the person who can convert the the poison into medicine, so to speak, right? The person that can come out of the sickness becomes the healer or the shaman versus continuing to be a sick person. And it's, you know, it's interesting. I'm sure we could talk for literally hours just on this one topic, but I love what you're saying in terms of the narrative around healing in general, because how I, how I would say it, both as um, uh, an experienced mystical state practitioner and as someone who's a long-term orgasmic meditation practitioner, that having unmitigated access to the mystical state reorients your compass. So it's it's not it's not a fixated 
idea or location on healing. I'm not, I'm not going into the mystical state to heal. Healing is a byproduct because in the mystical state, my compass is reoriented. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love what you're pointing to in terms of dismissing all of this other stuff that was happening inside the ceremony, you know, like just someone being able to make a phone call that they couldn't make or someone reconciling a part of them that they didn't like or approve of or weren't proud of. Th those are significant things that I, I, and again, this is just my opinion, but I happen mm -hmm. to think those have much longer term I don't even know that influence is the right word, but lo longer term significance in terms of people accessing flourishing mm -hmm. versus fi mm -hmm. versus fixating on a goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use um, the Christ story um, often this, this is, but you're bringing it up now. Is, um, the Christ story with the leper. So Christ healed mm -hmm. the leper. Mm -hmm. Um, so w w leprosy is a, what well, was a huge public health, it was a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a huge problem for the leper, the, the person who experienced leprosy. It was a huge problem. I don't want the leprosy community to come at me if I call them a leper. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, the family, clearly, there was shame and stigma yeah. um, and also disease and the community, you know, the trying to contain. Um, and so is that a story about how do we bottle this Christ energy to fix leprosy? Is that the message of the healing the leper? Or is the message no, that it's not. you touch? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, the it's message not. That, it's not. It's the mystical that 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 shows up in this miracle, which is yeah. a parlor trick for God. But it's this miracle. So the miracle of of the junkie being healed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, so Christ chooses that politicized body of the person with leprosy, mm -hmm. right? Ebola chooses the politicized body of the of the addict, the a leper. Mm -hmm. So, is it about alleviating leprosy or addiction, or is it about touching the untouchables? Is it about about loving the untouchables, loving the biggest, the the, the, the furthest yes. outcast in our society? And what can that mean on the material plane, which is what we're doing here? I, I talked to a Jesuit brother years ago and I was talking about this mystical experience and typical Jesuit, fucking brilliant. He says, uh, big fucking deal. What did you do today? What did you do today? What do you do with this mystical experience, right? Um, yeah. And having, and having access to it when the mystical becomes as real as this, that is to say, as unreal as this, right? And one exactly. Can walk in balance with that, and 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 you know, and then and we and and not to fetishize those spaces even, which a lot of psychedelic people have. A, um, and I'm a I'm a initiated fetish priest, but the but. That's a whole other, uh, whole other story, but um, but not to fetishize them so it becomes the message. And so that's the issue. We're not going to save the world. We're not going to heal, cure opioid crisis or overdose crisis. We're not going to save the world, I don't believe, through any spiritual practice uh, or psych psychedelics or religion. But we can use these tools. I believe we can use these tools, first of all, to challenge existing, not just challenge corrosive 
violent systems. And one of those is, in this case, is psychiatry, uh, uh, this pseudoscience that has so much power, the power to take children away or lock people in jail or throw people out of work um, or decide, you know, what drugs or weapons you can have or have not. Like basically things are supposed to be enshrined in the constitution based on a pseudoscience, right? Um, we can use all these practices to, these practices can come on bend and knee and what we know and ask to be accepted into the structures that um, in anyone's estimation are fucking things up. Um, and then further in the case of, of psychiatry, prop it up as it's seeking, seeking legitimacy in a totally illegitimate institution or we can see how we can use these drugs to like challenge the questions around what is healing, the questions around who has access to that, how do we get access to mystical states, and then body autonomy, but more importantly, can these tools be used as organizing tools so that we can shout down Babylon? so that we can use these tools to create a different society on, on, uh, on, the, on the material plane. So that's the challenge for me. In, I'm 62. That's my challenge over the next 10, 15, 20 years, how much time I got, I don't know. Um, and that's what really interests me. Um, I'll just, just say that the way I contextual, I want to say this one other piece, the way I contextualize things now, I don't work with Ebola any longer. I work, uh, I have a ketamine space, which is an art space in downtown Manhattan um, called Cardia. Beautiful space. Beautiful Thank space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do retreats in Jamaica with mushrooms. We do ketamine downtown. Um, my private practice for years has been MDMA and psilocybin, but within the within the container of vibrational instruments and sound. So I'm not from the Amazon. I'm also not from Johns Hopkins. I'm, you know, I'm, right. I'm not from the research at NYU. I'm not from Gabon. I'm a Greek boy from Detroit. I'm from here. And the cultural container of the arts particularly in North America, North and South America, and that infusion from around the world. That's what interests me. My ancestors are my spiritual ancestors, are my cultural ancestors. I have more to do with Billie Holiday and John Coltrane and, and, and Walt Whitman. And I don't come from that jungle or the lab. I come from the dance space, I come from the theater, I come from the book, I come from the theory, I come from those places. And to create ceremony that is free from the, from the corrosive, um, uh, uh, non-justified hierarchies in, inherent in so many religious and spiritual practices that create a space that one can be held and held deeply and honored deeply and loved deeply um, within a context of, uh, of sound and art. And then to bring, to liberate ourselves from the prison and the damage of best practices and to be able to be improvisational because you know, as a therapist and as a teacher, that the thing that's really important is the relationship. The technique is one thing, but the yeah. relationship, people can do orgasmic meditation, but if the relationship with teacher, I don't know anything much about it, but I imagine the relationship with teacher, the relationship in space, that's the most important thing. And, and space is the place, as our ancestor Sun Ra said, and that's the most important thing to me. So that's what I'm interested in doing. Um, and, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the I thing. Actually, I, I, we're actually have to have I love. Part two. What's that? We're well, we have, have to do part, do part two. two. For, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have I have a couple of thoughts. I I love this conversation so much. Um, so I have two thoughts. One one on 
the mystical state and accessing the mystical state. And then two, uh, to speak to the fact that you brought up orgasmic meditation. And, you know, the thing, the thing with orgasmic meditation is even when someone's coming to learn, it's an advanced practitioner relaying the container and the structure, but also the ethos of the practice, just like you would go and learn, you know, meditation, whether that's Vajrayana meditation or Mahayana meditation, like whatever it is, right? And it in inside of the container, the reason why orgasmic meditation has the container that it does is so that people can access the mystical state. And and so th then this leads me to the next point, which is Nicole recently wrote this really brilliant post on Instagram that I used this weekend in the Art of Addiction pilot facil facilitator, fac facilitator training, because I thought it was such an essential element to how to look at addiction as a path, but also it's a path that accelerates access to the mystical state. And she said, we're all trying to get to the same thing. All craving, all desire, all sickness is a longing for the mystical. And there's all these different entryways, right? And, and we talked about a lot today. There's drugs, there's spirituality, there's flow junkies, there's burning man enthusiasts, there's the occult, there's so many. And they all have their own specialties, but they also have their own challenges. And it's both, how do you recognize another seeker on the path to access the mystical state, but also how do you learn to navigate inside of it? And then, and I think what you're speaking to, which is how to titrate it back and, and bring it back into, you know, the, the world of form or the world of, of appearance. And I think that happens in contribution. Cause at least, at least for me personally, and, and I know that I know this from you personally, but also in what you're saying in your story is having access to the mystical state naturally has me want to contribute in, in whatever way that looks like it could, it could be art. It could be music. It could be writing. It could be being with people. It could be creating a business. Like, you know, we don't actually know what the art form looks like, but I, I do think that's the natural outcome. And I think every single person has that capacity inside of them. And I think that should be the focus versus mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. the, what's the he, quote unquote healing goal, right? And this is back to the thing that we talked about in the beginning, which is if you give someone unmitigated access to the mystical state, healing is not the focus. Healing is a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And, and that totally and, changes the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's, well, you know, there's, I had a guy come in here um, really suffering and he'd been through every single damn thing, electroshock and all this kind of stuff. He was a deeply unhappy young man. And I talked to him about our approach and talked to him, but, you know, he was focused on the so-called science. And he came in with all these reams of paper underlined in yellow from Johns Hopkins. And there was, and I'm going to get the formula wrong, but there's some sort of John Hopkins mystical test. And the idea was that the, you would take the three and a half, Right. You would yeah. take three and a half grams of mushrooms that would get you to a mystical state. And then the mystical state would, it would result in permanent neurological change. And that's just, I've got a high school education, but that just seems like total bullshit. And, and, and it'd be okay if it was just total bullshit, but this young man was believed it because he was suffering so much and it just deepened his suffering. He was not able to do that. There is no formula for that. That's nonsense. There's practice, there's failure, there's failure again, there's practice, there's suffering, there's going. I, I had a friend of mine, who was struggling with, with porn addiction. And he said, you know, he heard that, uh, that thing, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. So this guy just wanted to make all the connection in the world. And he just went out and he joined groups and he made groups and supported people. 
And he, when I was having dinner with him, and he's just like, so, you know, I've done this. I, my, my week is full of all this connection, and I'm still jacking off to, like, this, this porn that makes me feel awful. I was like, dude, your life is full, and you jack off the porn that's awful. <laughs> I mean, there's the, 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 that might get crowded out. It might not. But the first part was interesting. And the most interesting thing, you're living a full life, and you jack off the weird porn, right? So the idea that we're always, it could be a byproduct, maybe. But the thing in itself is the thing in itself. And what you're pointing to, what you're stating clearly is it's the thing you and I get to be in contribution every day. We wake up every day and we get to be in contribution. When I'm, when I'm at um, working, you know, at, at, let's say a, a created, co-created a, a holistic center at a, a needle exchange and drop-in center, when I'm at the drop-in center, I haven't worked in a couple of years, I'm going back soon in Harlem and people who are not housed and coming out of prison and just having a hard time or in the drop-in center and someone spills a cup of coffee. There's someone there to clean it up, the staff there, but five people will jump up because they want to clean it up. Yeah, They want to be in contribution. And that's at that sort of poverty level. How do, I think they might even have more opportunities to be in contribution because they're homeless and maybe, but that we have been turned into consumers. That's all we are. And very few people feel that they're in contribution, maybe except for in, with, with family. Um, and, but that's also been diminished. So I think you're pointing to something. And one thing that I noticed in Gabon, and I brought with me when I was doing work, uh, ceremonial ritual work without psychedelics, but people were on drugs in the drop-in center in the holistic space. We did a weekly ceremony. What I saw in Gabon was that Every single person had a job. It might be a young girl making omelets in the morning for the village. It might be someone whose job was to build the fire, to shake a rattle, to dance. Every single person was contributing. So this was, you know, was a great, uh, great anthropologist of Bwiti, in English, who wrote in English, Fernandez noticed that the last group of, of, of ethnic group to come to Buiti were the Fang people. And those were people that were working, the men were working at what they call plantations. I mean, it wasn't like a Southern plantation, but working for the French. Um, and they were deemed lazy because the type of work was much different than the type of work right. before. The type of work before is you just yeah. gather some stuff up and spend a couple of hours. And like when, when you had to build something, you did, but it wasn't this sort of um, agricultural, factory agricultural work. So they were deemed lazy. The women whose sort of personhood was tied up, well, tied up in, in, in fertility um, because of the French uh, and venereal disease, that fertility rate went way down, untreated venereal disease. And, French venereal disease is extra bad. Um, that's a joke, <laughs> but probably true. Um, but those those women had lost their personhood. But when they came to Buiti, when they, they found Buiti by working on these plantations with other ethnic groups, when they found that, they went from being a lazy so-and-so and, -so and a, you know, a useless right. this and that to being people who had contribution. So you see that in 12-step work, for instance. Totally. Everyone, as a yeah. job, you see that in the, uh, so many people in the harm reduction world, so many people in psychedelics did what I did, right? Um, and to various degrees of uh, effectiveness. And, uh, but so that natural tendency is simply not in our consumer capitalist society. And we're actually told that there's, the, the vibe is there's nothing we can do. The vibe is the science shows there's nothing we can do. That's what well, here I would actually argue with you. Here I would argue with mm -hmm. you. And that is, mm -hmm. I think the beauty of science and the reason why I'm such an advocate of science is science can show empirically what we know intuitively. And, I, you know, I personally am a fan of the MEQ because it's a way for people to measure these ineffable experiences and to say 
wait, I actually did touch something. I actually did experience something. But to what use? See, the, the, the deal is that you use a reductive, certainly I agree with you. I don't, first of all, I don't know what science broadly means. I know that there is a research industry that's job is to make research and to prove and research and development and to develop products. And that's what most of the university's research laboratories are geared towards. They want a product. It's not just the exploration of science and knowledge and curiosity. They better, I mean, and so what do they come with? Yeah, sure. It's an interesting, you, you, you reduce, reduce, reduce. And then the reduction, you take these folks who are reducing everything and then you apply it to mysticism and then leave them in charge and it's not about reduction. It's the opposite. So what they did with that. Yeah, I'm not, ta- I'm not to- talking about reduction. I'm not talking about reduction, but I, I will say, cause I, I, I'm a, I'm a deep fan of the people at John Hopkins. I, you know, Bill Richards and, and Roland Griffiths and, you know, the, the beauty with Roland also is because he, he was lightly familiar with orgasmic meditation and saw some data from orgasmic meditation because we had we had done us that we had used the meq survey on orgasmic meditation practitioners and we found very similar things that people who had practiced orgasmic meditation had the same had a same the same or similar experience to someone who had had a single moderate dose of psilocybin which and i can tell you as as a as a practitioner in many worlds, seeing that data for me was a confirmation of things I've known intuitively. And I think that element of it is important. And, you know, if, if you, if you, if you ever heard Roland talk about it, you know, when he, when he went in, he, he had a meditation practice, but wasn't, necessarily an an advocate or a practitioner of the mystical state. And it was over years of research, watching people have a similar experience. And and it doesn't matter how the experience shows up. I I do think depending on our, our background, our environment, our heritage, the mystical experience is experienced in different ways, but we're all touching the same thing. We're all going to the same thing, all experiencing the same thing. And so not in a reductionist way, but, but in a trying to find a common language, common language way, I do think research can be used. But but it, but it can be, but we're, you're, we're taking it out of the context of a reductionist practice and a reductionist economic system. And the problem with, with that narrative that I just heard is that he became an advocate. Stick with your research, buddy. Are you an advocate or are you a researcher? Even it's, and I, think you can, ad- I think you can actually be both. I, Cause I can tell you, I, you know, I spent three years doing a phase one clinical trial testing the safety of orgasmic meditation. I, I, I'm a practitioner first, right? So I, I, I already have bias because I, I know from my own experience, I'm someone who I, when I came into orgasmic meditation, I, I had a resume of DSM diagnoses. You know, I was like a walking, mm-hmm. like a walking, mm-hmm. talking, DSM, you know, it's, you know, part of my story is I got diagnosed and orgasmic because I had trauma mm-hmm. and I, and I happen to be somebody who's very resilient and was like, there's no, there's no way I'm just going to be this diagnosis for the rest of my life. And so, you know, it's, it set me on, on a journey that led me to orgasmic meditation. And, and so for me, there's a place like I, I already have bias because I, I'm an 18 year practitioner. And I I also have a mind of curiosity to be able to say, okay, well, it's true for me. And this is my experience. And it's true for the hundreds of people that I saw do, do the practice. But what happens when you test it? You know, that there's this quote, I think the Dalai Lama said, 
um, I'll follow the science, you know, cause they, they were doing research on to a series of Tibetan practices. And I think so, I think, don't quote me, but I think loosely what happened was somebody was interviewing him and said, you know, well, what happens if the science shows nothing happens? And then he says, well, I'll listen to the science. And so I, I think there's a way to bridge both and to have science and research support the mystical. Um, I think that um, that's hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I just have seen person after person after person carrying Pollen's book talking about the research coming out, talking about hearing Roland speak and wanting a result that would be the result I had or the result that you have and right. then not getting it because it's way more complicated than a survey and, sure. and, 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 and being really damaged by that. And then the power that we give to science, particularly, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, um, particularly uh, around uh, psychiatric um, uh, uh, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so-called, well, I would say disease, of, uh, not disease, I would say um, uh, experiences of mood and mind. Um, it's a track record that is deplorable, dangerous. And um, I think that they're, authority is not self-justifying and i think they got to prove it over and over again but you know um you know this guy robert whitaker who, who you should I suggest you read his journalism on the way drugs are tested for psychiatry yeah. I and mean, these are the standards the standards are nonsense um and and um and so that's what really concerns me I, I, joanna monquif um robert whitaker these are some of the people that i would look to Robert Whitaker yeah. told me in an interview when I asked him about like why why how these things become just you know these DSM diagnoses and this idea of brain chemistry which is complete bullshit now even they National Institute of Mental Health even admits it but you still get doctors and people talking about a chemical imbalance in the brain there's no test for it um there's there's you can't take a blood test and but uh, I asked him why, why, why would journalists? And what he said was that they're science journalists or people who look at science like Pollen did supposedly are just reporting back what the smart people say, just like the embedded journalists in Iraq, we're just gonna report back what the smart people in the military say. So there's not, so if it's science, then we need to have a scientific approach to what is science, Include and bringing in all the factors, including funding, including including endowments, and all that needs to be brought in. Just to say I'm a fan of science is like saying I'm a fan of meditation. Like what meditation? From where? And who's giving it? Is it the military uh, in 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 um, Malabar? Or is that the meditation we want? That uh, uh, is that the, the monks that we're going to follow? Like what does it mean? So I'm not a fan, or I don't agree or dis. I, but like, let's. How about we take a scientific approach and an actual journalistic approach to what we're called, what is called science, for people that can I, break I, it down. We're, oh, in, I'm out, we're in agreement. We're in agreement. Right on. Right on. Okay. <laughs> this has okay. been so fun and so amazing. I am so grateful that you did this. Thank you. And oh, let's do it again. Yes, we're for sure going to do it again. I'm going to text you after this to set it up. And this was okay. such a pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been Journey into the Mystic. Join us again, and we'll see you soon.